Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Katie Rykachewski. Katie earned her bachelor's in biochemistry at Seattle University, where she did undergraduate research on glycoproteins under Professor Joseph Langenhand. Afterwards, she came to the University of Michigan to pursue her PhD in the group of Professor Corinna Schindler, where she's recently defended her thesis on synthetic methods utilizing visible light energy transfer catalysis. And from there, I'll let you get started, Katie. Thank you very much for joining us today. First, I would like to thank Matt for inviting me to participate in this Research Spotlight episode. Very excited to be able to share a collaborative project working on the synthesis of high-energy, nitrogen-rich energetic materials. In the Schindler Group, we're very broadly interested in 2 plus 2 cycloadditions. And more specifically, we've been interested in generating heterocyclic compounds using visible light photocatalysis and triple energy transfer sensitization. The benefit of using triple energy transfer is that you can avoid the use of UV light, which is typically used to directly excite a substrate from the ground state to its excited state. And instead, you can utilize a photosensitizer that can absorb visible light to access its singlet excited state, inter-system cross to the triplet state, and then transfer that triplet state to a ground state substrate. So it's directly accessing its reactive triplet state that can then perform the two plus two cycloaddition with an alkene. There are a variety of different photosensitizers that can perform these reactions. They generally fall into two main categories, metal-based photocatalysts. These are often iridium and ruthenium-based. There are also completely organic photosensitizers. Our lab has been interested in this for a number of years, and we first started in this area with the synthesis of azetidines, and we've done this through two different approaches. One approach that we have looked at is harnessing triplet state cyclic oxymes. We have also looked at the corresponding excited state alkenes, in this case, activated alkenes like styrenes and dienes. Additionally, we've done work in the area of the Paterno-Buchi reaction, where we've been able to use triplet energy transfer sensitization to access triplet state carbonyls that then react to form oxetanes. There has also been great work done by Teshik Yoon's group in this area as well. And finally, we've looked at the unsaturated analog of an azetidine, which is referred to as an azetine, where we've been able to take those cyclic triplet state oxymes and react them with alkynes instead of alkenes. And these types of methodologies that we've developed, we're really interested in what types of applications they might be useful for. In publishing these types of works, we potentially imagined applications such as unnatural amino acid synthesis, as well as the synthesis of bioactive derivatives, natural product structures, additionally, the use of these compounds as bioisosteres, and finally, as pharmaceutical or agrochemical compounds. And this is really where we thought we might get some interest in the field regarding our methodologies. So as we were publishing these papers, we were actually quite surprised to be contacted by Jesse Sabatini, who works for the U.S. Army Research Laboratory. And he was interested in how his expertise in energetic material synthesis could overlap with our expertise in the synthesis of these strain rings. And this was something we, you know, really hadn't thought about before. I mean, it was something we didn't know a lot about, but we were excited about potentially entering a new research area and familiarizing ourselves with it. So I do want to give some background into what we might consider to be an ideal energetic material. I think some of these considerations might sound quite obvious, but you want something that's going to be safe to handle. It should have a specific physical trigger, should be stable upon storage. In the case of a solid, a sharp melting point at a useful temperature. And very importantly, you don't want something that's going to be volatile. And really this all boils down to, you want something that can predictably and reliably release a large amount of energy, but only under very specific conditions. And when you start thinking about all of the different parameters that need to be optimized for this, it's actually quite similar to the multi-parameter optimization that is done in drug design, where you have a lot of different things that are being balanced together to hopefully give you the most ideal performance. I do think the area of energetic materials and medicinal chemistry are really not that far apart from each other. So I think kind of a unique historical example of this would be nitroglycerin, which was first synthesized in the mid-1800s. 
It was Alfred Nobel who developed the industrial scale synthesis of nitroglycerin. And then it was about a decade later when physicians and pharmacologists started using small doses of nitroglycerin to alleviate hypertension. And about 100 years later, they discovered the mechanism by which nitric oxide works to dilate the blood vessels around the heart. And that is what essentially nitroglycerin is doing. And now today, you know, we still work on different drugs to alleviate hypertension, and they're much more complex than nitroglycerin is. But this type of understanding that we were able to gain in the 18s and 1900s really started from this energetic material. And so I think it's kind of an interesting bridge between these two areas in which I think organic chemists have spent a lot more time thinking about medicinal chemistry than maybe energetic materials. There are two main areas of energetic materials that were of interest to our collaborators at the U.S. Army Research Lab. The first was solid melt castable materials. So probably the most well-known melt castable is TNT. So these are going to be solid materials that have a high melting point. And then importantly, it needs to have a large difference between the melting and decomposition temperatures. So with these compounds, they want to be able to melt them safely without any premature decomposition occurring. Additionally, they're interested in liquid materials, and these are utilized as propellant plasticizers. So in this case, you still want to have a high decomposition temperature, but what is really key for these is having a low freezing temperature. And so there's not really that many energetic propellant plasticizers that have been developed to date, two of which are shown here. But thinking about the types of applications that these are used for, you can think of something like a solid rocket booster for a space shuttle, where you can change the physical properties of that fuel component by adding in a plasticizer. And ideally, if it's an energetic plasticizer, you're really benefiting many different parameters. It's also important to note that these types of materials are not interchangeable with each other. So you're going to be fine tuning them either as a liquid plasticizer or as a solid melt castable. It might not be too surprising that strain rings have also been explored as energetic materials. Predominantly, what has been discovered is cyclobutane based materials. So there's been really excellent work done by Phil Barron in collaboration with Jesse Sabatini on these cyclobutane polynitric ester materials. But when thinking about a heterocyclic variant of this, such as an azetidine, there's not as much known in this area, but there's a lot of potential benefits. So that nitrogen also offers a site for nitration. By removing a carbon, you're improving the overall oxygen balance of the material. But unfortunately, there's just limited synthetic methodologies for accessing highly substituted azetidines. There's only been one azetidine-based energetic material that has been thoroughly looked at to date, and that's trinitroazetidine. So this was considered a very promising energetic material in the early 80s. Unfortunately, its development ended up being halted due to its high vapor pressure in the molten state, and this led to significant safety processing hazards. But seeing that this was really all that was known when it came to azetidine energetics, we felt like we could really improve upon this. And some of the different design principles we had in mind would be adding substitution alpha to the nitrogen, as well as introducing stereocenters to the azetidine ring and varying the stereochemistry, also introducing additional nitrogen and oxygen atoms. And we felt like overall that this could increase the energetic performance of these, but also tune the physical properties to make it safer to work with. And you know, while this looks great on paper, at the end of the day, this really is a synthetic challenge simply due to the limited synthetic methods. And also that our collaborators at the Army Research Lab we're going to require approximately five grams of the nitration precursor so they'd have enough material to study the nitration and subsequent characterization of these materials. And here is just the bare bones scaffolds that we were interested in looking at. So varying the substitution at each of the carbons, as well as looking at stereochemistry to see if that would alter the physical properties of these. And if you tried to think about one method that could access all of these different substitution patterns, it's pretty unlikely. And so we knew at the forefront of this that we would likely need to employ multiple synthetic strategies. 
our collaborators were able to run some initial calculations on this completely symmetric nitroazetidine shown here, in which the calculated properties seem to be very comparable or even better than TNT, which is the classic reference compound for the development of energetic materials. And so seeing that this theoretically looked promising, we wanted to see if we could access this structure to get experimental results. Seeing that the calculated properties looked quite promising, we wanted to proceed with the synthetic approaches to access a material like this. So we would need to be able to synthesize the nitration precursor, which would be these primary alcohols. And we envision that one or multiple of these azetidines would be produced through an intramolecular cyclization. And that type of substrate for cyclization could be formed from these starting components shown on the right here. So in a forward synthetic sense, we were able to take this dial and benzyl protect and then perform an epoxidation, then open the epoxide with benzyl amine and alkylate the nitrogen. And then taking this amino alcohol, we can chlorinate it to form the amino chloride. And at this point, we're ready to do the cyclization to form the azetidine. And so taking this amino chloride and subjecting it to basic conditions, we are able to access two diastereomers of this azetidine product, the major one being the all cis one shown on top. Um, but you can see that even these two together combined only account for a fairly low yield. The rest of the mass balance falls with these two other products. So the Grob fragmentation, which is the product of the second step of our synthesis, and then elimination of the chloride. And we did fairly extensive optimization to try to improve the ratios of these different products, but ultimately we couldn't get the reaction to perform all that much better. And at this point, we were really just curious if these compounds at all were going to perform well as energetic materials. And so we decided just to push this forward on a very large scale. And so taking 61 grams of our amino chloride, subjecting it to our conditions, we could isolate 15 grams of the major diastereomer. And at this point, we just continued forward with the major diastereomer. The last two steps are reduction of the ester and debenzylation under hydrogenolysis conditions. It is very gratifying to be able to access a little over five grams of this final material to be able to send to our collaborators to see if they could nitrate this material and see what those energetic properties might be. I do want to take a second here just to talk about safety when it comes to dealing with energetic compounds. While it's something we did not personally do in our group, we really left it to the experts at the Army Research Lab. You know, while we sent multiple grams of this, performing the nitrations for the first time, our collaborator worked with extreme sensitivity, working only with small quantities first, running the reaction behind a blast shield, and utilizing Kevlar gloves and lab coats. So while safely doing this chemistry, it was very exciting to see that they were able to perform the nitration in overall good yield to form this completely symmetric nitroazetidine product here. And this material turned out to be very promising as an energetic material, and it was classified as a potential melt castable material. So again, this would be similar to the type of energetic that TNT is, where you have a solid material with a high melting point and an even higher decomposition temperature. And so at this point, we were really excited to continue moving forward with this collaboration. And we wanted to think about making other regioisomers and stereoisomers of these types of azetidines. But looking at our synthetic route, there were clearly limitations present. It took roughly 60 grams of the amino chloride just to access enough of the one diastereomer. So it was quite low yielding and not stereodivergent. And overall, it took eight steps and 15% overall yield to access this tri-alcohol product. And so we wanted to consider other synthetic strategies. I won't talk in great detail about all of these strategies, but we did look at epimerizing that all cis azetidine to the other diastereomer. We additionally looked at this nitrile substrate, which performed much better in the cyclization as far as yield and diastereoselectivity, but that nitrile just couldn't be converted to something useful to us as a nitration precursor. 
And finally, we looked at a very different approach in which we attempted to ring expand these azeridine starting materials. But ultimately, none of these strategies were super successful. And so we had to really change how we were approaching the synthesis of these azetidines. And something that was not foreign to us was two plus two cycle additions to efficiently access four membered rings, specifically azetidines. We felt like visible light ASA paternum buchy reaction could be leveraged to synthesize similar azetidine products. So we could use our cyclic oxime that we have previously studied, perform an intermolecular 2 plus 2 cycle addition to form the bicyclic azetidine. We could then begin transforming this into something that would be able to undergo nitration by reducing the ester and cleaving the NO bond to access the free monocyclic azetidine. And the reason we hadn't started with this strategy is just that these types of products at the end of the day are always going to have this additional methylene unit in it from that five-membered ring bond cleavage. But consulting with our collaborators felt like these materials would still be of interest and that extra carbon wasn't going to hinder the energetic performance. So we set out to look at this transformation. Our group had previously disclosed this type of 2 plus 2 cycle addition but it had only been performed on subgram quantities. And at this point, we wanted to scale it up to a multigram scale. We were able to do that by lowering the catalyst loading and increasing the concentration. And this allowed us to use a typical photochemical setup that we would have in one of our hoods, but still get grams of material out of it. What was very exciting to see was that we could access now both stereoisomers in a one-to-one ratio, and they were easily separable. So at this point, we could separate these bicyclic azetidines and carry them forward through the rest of the synthetic sequence. The next step was reduction of the ester to the primary alcohol using red al. And then finally, we could cleave the NO bond and debenzylate to form the monocyclic azetidine products. So we're able to access multiple grams of each of these materials that we then sent to our collaborators where they were able to perform the nitration and good yield to access these nitroazetidine products. And these are actually quite different than what we had previously seen in that these were now liquid energetic materials and they had high onset of decomposition temperatures and they also had low freezing temperatures. And so this was ideal as a potential propellant plasticizer. Something that we were aware of, though, at the time was that this intermolecular 2 plus 2 reaction has an inherent regioselectivity associated with it, and that you react through this 1,4 bi radical, and you're always going to get substitution next to the nitrogen when using a terminal alkene like this. So if you try to think about how to get substitution at the position across from the nitrogen, that's something that just can't be done through an intermolecular approach. And so we developed an intramolecular 2 plus 2 cycle addition, where when you tether these two components together, you force it to react through this 1,4 bi radical that can then form these tricyclic azetidine products that we felt like could be further expanded to the nitration precursors. So we're able to synthesize this substrate here. And then we subjected it to very similar conditions like we had done for the intermolecular approach, but the reaction was very messy and low yielding. And seeing that this was intramolecular, we felt like the concentration was playing a large role in this. We looked at this in more detail, and even running the reaction at 0.1 molar, you can clearly see other things are being formed, and you can actually detect this intermolecular dimer by high-res mass spec, And you can imagine that higher order ligamers could also form. What was promising to see though, was that as you reduce the concentration, you can start to get to really clean reaction profiles like this reaction at 0.01 molar. The only problem with this is that it's just not really practical to run a multigram reaction at that low of a concentration. So it requires a lot of solvent. This leads to excessive sparging, more lamps, And the more lamps you have, typically the more cooling that you need to have. And so this wasn't something we were particularly excited about. And so we're actually able to overcome this by instead running the reaction five times as concentrated, but using a slow addition of the substrate into a solution of photocatalyst. So here, just irradiating a solution of the photocatalyst 
the substrate is added in over eight to nine hours and then it's just left to stir overnight and this gives us a 70 percent yield in a one-to-one -one mixture of two tricyclic diastereomeric products the rest of the synthetic sequence follows the same where we can now reduce the selactone to the corresponding dial and then finally debenzylate and cleave the NO bond to form these tetra alcohol products. Now we could send our five grams of each of these to our collaborators where they performed a global nitration to access these pentanitrated azetidine products. So these were also quite interesting when it came to their physical properties and that the diastereomer on the left was again classified as a melt castable material, so a high melting temperature with an even higher onset of decomposition. The diastereomer of it on the right initially appeared to be a liquid, but upon storage in the freezer over a couple months, it actually ended up solidifying to a low melting solid. This is just a great example of how stereochemistry really impacts energetic materials where just this one stereo center changes the melting point, but this really changes the types of applications these materials would be used for. So had you only made one of these materials, you might really be missing out on a promising energetic in a different area. In total, with our collaboration, we were able to develop two new standalone melt castable materials. We were also able to synthesize two low melting solid materials, and then finally two liquid propellant plasticizer energetic materials. We did have one that could not be successfully nitrated, where when we had these two quaternary centers, nitrogen of the azetidine, it was just too sterically encumbered for that nitration to proceed fully. But just in general, looking across all of the different nitroazetidines that we developed, it's really interesting to see how these small structural changes really impact the types of applications these materials are used for. So even just diastereomers versus regioisomers or adding and taking away substitution can result in vastly different energetic materials. And just in general, looking at this work, I think, you know, beyond just generating superior energetic materials, I think the efficient and scalable synthetic routes that we developed can really enable a lot of other fields as well. So we were able to synthesize a number of different novel azetidines, so not just these nitroazetidines, but all the precursors, including the monocyclic, bicyclic, and tricyclic azetidine products, all synthesized on multigram scale, I think could be of interest to a number of other fields. And so we're excited to be able to put this methodology out there. And again, think about where this chemistry might take us. Well, I'm very fortunate to be the one that gets to share this work with you today. This work could not have happened without all of the people here. So I want to thank Dr. Mark Becker, as well as my advisor, Corinna Schindler, and Mansi Anandpur, who's an undergraduate who really impacted this project, and definitely everyone at the Army Research Laboratory, especially Dr. Jesse Sabatini, who really initiated this collaboration and has just been an absolute pleasure to get to work with and everyone else on the Army Research Laboratory team. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Katie for joining us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.